Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the audience and our friends, uh, friends of the Education Exchange and friends of Dr. Steve Murley, who is our guest tonight. I'm Hani al Kali, your host, representing uh, John Karhoff and Mike Peterson. Uh, John Karhoff just told me that it has been nearly 20 years we have been on the air, Dr. Murley, and uh, the, one of the best years we have had so far is uh, with you. And, uh, and this is the second year we uh, have you on our show, and uh, we're proud of your accomplishments. Well, thank you for all and that you're, you're doing for getting the word out uh, in Iowa City and the across the world on the internet. You proved to be a very visionary, uh, youthful leader to our school system here. And uh, I, I cannot thank you enough for all you, you have done. And uh, I actually came up with about 400 questions. Is that enough for you tonight? It might be a little more than we can uh, <laughs> cover over the evening here. I remember when we had our first uh, production meeting last year and you said, don't worry, just ask me any question. Uh, no limits and no boundaries, right? That's right. So you are going to be uh, surprised tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so good. get ready. <laughs> Keep me on my toes. Uh, Dr. Murley, first of all, uh, I would like you uh, to tell us about your uh, predictions. Let us not use the word prediction because it's kind of uh, more poetic. Uh, your reading of the future of our enrollment in our schools. Sure. Uh, and maybe I'll actually back up a little bit and, and uh, talk about uh, how we deal with the enrollment increases that we have this year. You can back up as much as you want to, but uh, be careful of that tree behind you. <laughs> we have, uh, we were really blessed this summer. Uh, we wound up uh, having over 100 new staff members join the district. And they represent not only uh, staff members that are replacing people who left the district, uh, but those staff members are also people who uh, are filling positions that were created mid-year last year. Uh, I think many people in the audience will remember that uh, we had above average growth last year. We had over 400 uh, children uh, as new members of the district. And that put us in a position where we added new staff mid-year. And this year we did the permanent hires for those. So it was very, very heartening uh, to come to the beginning of the school year and, and uh, to sit with the 100 plus new teachers as, as they became members of our family and joined the team. Uh, so looking forward, we anticipate that our growth will be approximately 200 or a little bit more than that each year. Uh, and knowing that, uh, we're planning accordingly, and that means making sure we have enough teachers uh, so that our class sizes stay reasonable, uh, and also that we look forward uh, in regards to the facilities in the district and start asking ourselves some difficult questions about uh, where we don't have enough space now and where we anticipate we won't have enough space moving forward. And that's at all levels. That's at the elementary level, the junior high level, and the high school level. We know right now we're really pressed uh, at the elementary level and the high school level and it's only going to be a couple of year, more years before we start to feel that same level of pressure at the junior high. So it's really incumbent upon us right now, and the board has undertaken that challenge uh, and is having discussions through our facilities committee meetings about next steps for us. Uh, we had a great uh, uh, opportunity last week to talk to the board uh, in closed session about property acquisition. Uh, you can't build schools until you own some property, uh, and so we're out looking right now, and we're looking literally in all four corners of the district. Uh, recognizing that uh, we're blessed with growth and that it's happening throughout the district. So uh, we're trying to set ourselves up uh, from a long-range planning standpoint so that we are able to uh, have a more active and, and um, vibrant dialogue with the community about next steps. Great. Uh, as far as uh, the west and the east side, this whole uh, discourse that has been going on since I was born, <laughs> is, there, is, there, is there a way to explain to the audience, uh, to, to look at the camera and tell them, to assure them how fair you've been trying to be to both sides? Because the, the East side, as a matter of fact, they don't feel they have the same uh, interest, uh, not interest, but the same focus uh, from the board and the leadership. Uh, about their education system 
uh, compared with what's happening on the west side? Sure. Uh, I'll talk about it from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, I, first of all, I, uh, one of the things that I have heard frequently uh, from people, and not just on the east side, but uh, from parents, and faculty members, uh, and in some cases students uh, in schools that have a longer history in our district, is that uh, they're concerned that we have not applied the same level of resources uh, to our older buildings. And that could be buildings as far north as Penn, as far west as Coralville Central. Uh, and, and their request of us is to make sure that when we are allocating dollars uh, in the district for infrastructure work, uh, that that be allocated in a way that's designed to make sure that from classroom to classroom and from building to building, we create the same equitable learning environment for all students. And I think that's a rational expectation that the community should have of us as, as an administrative team, as a school board, uh, is that we're developing that level of uniformity in terms of uh, the environment that students are educated in. Uh, on to your next question, which is recognizing the challenge that that presents, knowing the issues that we have with enrollment growth. Uh, I think the next question that we have to ask ourselves is knowing what our needs are, understanding that we don't know all of our needs, and then looking at the, the funding streams that are available to us, do we have enough of, uh, money on hand to address those issues? Uh, our immediate analysis is that we don't. Uh, and the problem with that is when you don't have enough money to meet all those needs, uh, the choices that you make can create winners and losers. And we want to try to avoid that. Uh, so as we look forward, we're doing a couple of things to deal with that. Uh, one of them is we're really trying to identify what our needs are for new buildings. Uh, and that is based on what our enrollment trends look like. Uh, for our existing buildings, we're really trying to understand what's the true cost of ownership for each of those buildings over the next 10 years uh, so that we have a, a very deep understanding of the work that needs to be done on each building over that time frame, and we can get a total cost for that. Uh, and I think that uh, by being transparent, by sharing that information uh, with the general public and by advertising what we really see our needs to be, uh, I think the next step in that process is going to be have, having a dialogue with the board, with the general public, about where we're short and what we need to do about that and what our options are uh, in terms of looking for other funding streams that can help out with that. Uh, in the end, what we really want to do is we want to create a win-win scenario. Uh, we want to make sure that we can address the needs of our existing infrastructure and make sure that there is that parity across uh, buildings and across classrooms. And then we also want to make sure that we understand that we don't have enough seats now and, and plan well for where to build those new seats. And can you, uh, can you again explain to our parents and audience uh, uh, what do you exactly mean when you, uh, I attended a couple of your meetings with uh, your uh, uh, team, mm -hmm. and you always stress this idea of data or data driven uh, decision making. Yeah. Uh, what, is, uh, what is exactly your meaning? Well, I, I, we're going to look at it uh, in terms of the, the, the uh, issues that I talked about that we're facing right now. Uh, there, there are a couple of key sources uh, that we need uh, in order to develop the appropriate uh, data sets for it. One of them is our enrollment uh, projections. And we need to make sure that we can go out far enough. Uh, and our business office tells us we need to really be able to go out 10 years. Uh, and, and create uh, a reasonable projection for what our enrollment will look like over that time frame. And if, if you're a data wonk and you enjoy that, uh, you know that we'll develop a trend line and there'll be a confidence interval around that trend line so that we know that uh, we should be fairly accurate next year and the further out we get, the less accurate we get, but we still have a, a fairly tight band to know we should be bigger than this, smaller than that. Uh, and by knowing that, uh, that helps us predict how many seats do we need and when do we need those seats at the elementary level, the junior high, and the high school level. So it's important for us to have that enrollment uh, uh, information. One of the things that we also have to recognize is that we are very fortunate in Iowa City. Uh, I, when I'm visiting superintendents uh, around the country, talking to the U.S. Department of Ed, uh, I, sometimes I feel awkward when I tell them that the economy is strong here relative to the rest of the state, to the rest of the country, when I tell them about the education levels of the people that live in our community, the investment and the involvement that they have in public education. So for us, we're very fortunate. Uh, and, and most districts around uh, uh, us in Iowa, most districts north of the, the Rust Belt, if you will, are not experiencing the kind of growth that we are. Uh, and, and while that's a challenge, uh, it 
presents opportunities for us that districts that are declining enrollment don't have. And so it's our job to manage that opportunity uh, so that it benefits all the children in the district. And, and uh, knowing our enrollment trends will help us set ourselves up so that we're ready for those children when they turn five and, and enter kindergarten. Uh, another thing that we're looking at from a data standpoint is I talked about knowing the total cost of ownership for the buildings in the district. Uh, we don't know that right now. And the difficulty with that is we don't know what the aggregate cost is to keep up all of the buildings that we currently own. And we're being challenged, and I think rightfully so, by people who say, how can you support building new buildings if you don't know how much it's going to cost to maintain the buildings that you have? So I think simultaneously as we look to those enrollment trends and look to those new seats, we also have to look to fully understand what it's going to cost us to maintain these buildings that we have now so that nothing deteriorates over the course of the next 10 years. And so we're going to work with uh, uh, somebody who has some expertise in, in doing this to both project our enrollment numbers and to help us determine the total cost of ownership for all the buildings in the district. I think that's the kind of data that uh, helps us make good decisions. I also think that's the kind of data that we can share with the community so that they have an opportunity to, if you, if you will, they can see behind the curtain and they can see what it is upon which we're basing our decisions. And, and in a community like this, that gives them the opportunity to analyze the work we're doing and then to hold us accountable. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, living here for more than 30 years and seeing one system after another, I think this is probably the, the highest level of transparency I've seen so far. And, and because of this, I would like you uh, to tell me, uh, what's the story of Roosevelt? I mean, that's, that's a big... Uh, sure. I mean, you finished uh, the activity of the summer, and then the first accomplishment was Roosevelt is back to the bosom of the community. And, and I'll give you the, the Reader's Digest version in case there's anybody uh, watching who hasn't uh, watched, the, the yeah. hasn't seen the whole process unfold. Uh, but when uh, Roosevelt uh, was slated to close as an elementary school, uh, then uh, uh, there was a committee put together to decide what to do with the building. Uh, and two of the recommendations out of the, the four were to sell the building. One of the recommendations was to see if there was a municipality that was interested or another, uh, non, uh, uh, another governmental agency that would be interested in taking it over. Uh, and then the, the fourth one was for us to keep it and repurpose it. And uh, at the time we got the first appraisal, it was appraised at over three quarters of a million dollars. And uh, thinking that we could uh, attain a number at or above the appraisal rate uh, for the property, the decision was made to sell the property. So we put it on the market uh, and uh, we did not get that type of offer for it. Uh, we actually had it reappraised because the result of the committee was to protect parts of the property. If we're going to be lifelong citizens of Iowa City as a school district and we're going to be good neighbors, uh, important for us to listen to the community that surrounds the school and there were things that they wanted to make sure that we didn't do on the property. They wanted to make sure we preserved the ravine, that we didn't put a gas station in there or a liquor store or other things like that. So we put a lot of restrictions on selling the property and that meant that we couldn't get as much money for it. So after reviewing that and, and knowing that uh, the only bid that we got was substantially less than, than uh, what the board wanted to get for it, uh, the board tabled any decisions about selling the property. Uh, and so we looked at that and, and rather than letting the building sit mothballed uh, while we waited to decide what to do with it, uh, we looked around at programs that didn't have district sites. Uh, and they were actually in rented facilities around the, uh, the community and we said, would there be an opportunity and would we be able to enhance the education of those children if we brought them together under one roof? And the administrative analysis of that was that we certainly could. We can enrich the lives of the kids uh, by providing a more comprehensive set of facilities for them uh, for their education. Uh, it would be better for the staff because we could centralize some support for them. Uh, and that uh, as a district, uh, we would get some economies uh, by having them under one roof regarding transportation, food service, other things like that. Uh, so we are slowly starting to move programs uh, into the Theodore Roosevelt Education Center. Uh, we'll move uh, first programs that'll come in will be our bridges programs and our homeschool assistance programs. Uh, we're also looking at moving our connections, our T3, uh, eventually programs like STEP will move in there. And uh, again, this will give us an opportunity uh, to take programs that, that uh, were in storefronts around town, bring them together under one educational roof, 
uh, centralized support services for them, and we think in the end enrich the educational experiences of the children who go to school there. And uh, in, in, in order to respond to some of the uh, expected, uh, uh, every every time a decision is made, you you can find some comment, you know. Sure. But uh, being a public forum here and representing the community, uh, I would like to uh, discuss with you the. Uh, some opinion that was raised um, by one of the audience. And this was uh, related to, uh, well, now you're back to uh, Roosevelt, that you uh, claimed uh, to be not so good for kids. And now you're going to put other kids there. Sure. So how do you address this? I mean, uh, yep, that's a, that's a very good question. And uh, one of the things that we're uh, fortunate to be able to do uh, is the programs that we're moving in there aren't like a full elementary school in the sense that they don't have full complements of first, second, third, fourth graders, et cetera. Uh, and by moving the programs in slowly over the course of the year, and part of that timing is as the leases expire on the storefronts that these uh, uh, programs are in, it gives us the opportunity to get in there and do some work that otherwise hadn't been done to make sure that when they move into that particular, particular portion of the building that they're going to reside in, that we've been able to bring it up to speed. Uh, we do recognize there's some long-term costs associated with the building, and just like all the rest of the buildings in the district, when we fully understand what the total cost of ownership is for that building, uh, we'll be able to go back to the board and present that dollar figure to them and say, given that bringing this building up to speed so that these classrooms are on par with all the rest of the classrooms in the district, uh, it's going to cost us this much money. Is this an investment that's both good for the district good for the community and certainly is it appropriate for the kids who are in those programs. Uh, we'll certainly know a lot more about that uh, after the course of the year when those programs have been able to, to cohabitate, if you will, uh, over at least a portion of the school year. We'll have a better understanding of how they work together when they are under one roof and I think that'll influence the decision when we go to the board and talk to them about the cost of making sure that Roosevelt is uh, up to speed uh, as an educational entity. But again, uh, you know, that original question about how do you make sure that it's uh, prepared for the students uh, and see if yeah the, the, the short answer to that is that because they're moving in in stages we can make uh, the net we can do the necessary work in stages and be prepared for them when they move in well, that's a very logic mm -hmm. very reasonable and uh, uh, n now w with the fact that you are I um, I myself probably understand a little bit some of the uh, concerns that people have about the silo money mm -hmm. and uh, some people are talking about promises broken some people are talking about and 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 I I respect their concerns because uh, maybe a little clarification here sure because uh, I discovered that some of my friends don't know even that there were 20 million dollars that had already been uh, spent on right. improvement right. of the uh, performance of the buildings and the uh, structure, integrity, mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, so tell me about this 3520 that we can read in every little article. Sure. In the uh, uh, first of all, I, maybe uh, I'll be back up a little bit, but not in yes. the tree. Uh, <laughs> that uh, we have two pots of money uh, that help us deal with our infrastructure. Uh, and not all the money goes to buildings, but parts of both of these income streams go to the buildings, and those are what's commonly referred to as PEPL, which is right. the physical plant and equipment levy, and then we also uh, refer to SILO, although uh, in education we love acronyms. The next thing you're going to hear is SAVE, uh, uh, because uh, uh, it's Securing an Advanced Vision for Education, and that's actually the acronym that that uh, flow of income uh, falls under as of this past July 1st. And, and SAVE is actually a statewide program of which SILO was a part. Uh, so the, and that's the, uh, that income stream is the one that most people have the questions about. But we use both of those income streams uh, to help maintain our buildings. Uh, and actually from a transparency standpoint, I know it's not necessarily the easiest place to get to on the okay. website, but if you go out to the budget uh, department on the website and you look on the right hand side, you'll actually find uh, links that'll take you to 
uh, the PEPL expenditures since it was uh, in place in 2007, and the silo expenditures above 50,000, and those between 10 and 50,000. We didn't do the ones under 10,000 because the list was enormous. But you can actually go out there and look, and it shows you building by building, year by year, what was done in each of those buildings. Uh, we did that because uh, many people didn't see some of the repair work that was done. It might have been behind the scenes, might have been above the, the ceiling tiles type of thing. And so we wanted to make sure that everybody could see the work that was done in each building and how much money was actually allocated to each building. Uh, now, the, the question about the, the $35 million and the $20 million, uh, the superintendent limitations, which the board right. has set for me, uh, uh, dictate how some of the dollars should be retained and then expended. Uh, the $20 million, uh, that retention was designed for elementary facilities and has actually already been expended. And it was expended through the Garner Project and through the Borlaug Project. So both of those elementary schools uh, went through the construction process, uh, which uh, were uh, a satisfaction of that right. limitation. Uh, the next one, which people talk about regularly, is the retention of money for a third comprehensive high school. And that's Superintendent Limitation 3C7, for those that are looking it up. Uh, and it, uh, it uh, requires me to develop a budget for those silo save funds that uh, at the expiration of the, the current silo revenue purpose statement in 2017 will have aggregated $32 million to be used uh, for a third comprehensive high school. So each year when the silo dollars come in, uh, because of that limitation, uh, about $2.9 million is earmarked uh, to go into that, uh, that fund uh, so that at the end of that uh, revenue purpose statement, those dollars will be available to be expended on a third high school. That's actually what the board is currently uh, in discussion about. Uh, came up at uh, a governance meeting and then again at the last uh, uh, full board meeting. Uh, they also have it slated for discussion at the upcoming board meeting on October 2nd. And the question is, should that money stay earmarked uh, for a third comprehensive high school, or should it be deallocated? And that is, go back into the full silo pool of money, uh, which uh, the state stipulates what you can spend those dollars on, but should those dollars go in there in an unrestricted capacity? Uh, I've also received questions about this. I presume you most likely will after the broadcast today. Uh, people ask, well, what happens if it's deallocated? And uh, another step in the process is every year the district administrative team prepares uh, a facility plan, uh, which we bring to the board, and the board approves that plan. And that plan uh, goes through building by building and stipulates which projects we will do this year. And it, it goes through and spells out uh, all those projects that are above $50,000. We have an appendix, which is every project below $50,000. And uh, our goal is to expend those dollars that we take in from silo, with the exception of monies that are retained for other things. We have some monies retained for technology, some for the Family Resource Center, some for the third high school. And so we expend, as with PEPL, we expend uh, almost all those dollars. We save some for contingencies. You never know when you might need a a roof or a boiler or something like that right. in the middle of the year due to some unforeseen catastrophe. And so uh, there's always some money that's retained for contingency. Uh, but that that's not retained for contingency is then spent on our facilities. Uh, and so if that money was deallocated, then we would bring forward a facilities plan that would allocate those funds to other projects that we're currently working on. Excellent. Um, I think we, we have a little time to uh, address one of my concerns because next time I think we are going to see you, Dr. Merley, on the October 29th. Yes, we are. We are going to have a, a taping here for that and yes. it probably it will be broadcast uh, in a couple of nights after that. Uh, so we'll, we'll discuss STEM, uh, we'll just talk about a lot of things. But one of the nagging questions about teachers relationship with administration and uh, association and so forth because I have to be honest with you I was not very happy with Chicago uh, walk out I, I just happened to be an old-fashioned guy I and mean, you select this uh, uh, noble profession and you know that it's not to be a millionaire you're not going to be a millionaire when you do that it's it's a mission and uh, to walk out of the kids who are in need, uh, for me, that was uh, rude and crude. And I uh, would have preferred other, any other way rather than leaving the kids 
without supervision, uh, without anything to do, maybe crimes, maybe selling drugs, maybe, and, and, and some of them need to be, to, to be in school and to eat in mm -hmm. school oh, yes. and uh, to punish uh, minority kids and poor kids, disadvantaged kids, because uh, I need a couple uh, hundred dollars more, uh, I think is, uh, was very shocking for me, to me, to, to hear. Uh, you uh, have developed a good relationship with your uh, teaching staff here. We have. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're very fortunate that we have a wonderful relationship with the uh, ICEA, uh, which represents a majority of our teachers in the district, uh, and also with uh, the other groups, both those represented by associations and those that are independent. But uh, our goal is to make sure that we have ongoing dialogue. Uh, I meet monthly with the ICEA president. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to maintain open channels of communication. Uh, I think when you see labor strife like you saw in Chicago, uh, what that says to me is somewhere along the line the communication broke down. Uh, and uh, trust is built on relationships, and that takes time. Uh, and if you wait until there's a crisis to try and meet and address it, uh, it's hard to develop that trust. Uh, you really develop those relationships and you develop that trust when there isn't a crisis. Well, we can assure the audience that the kids would be all right. in school and they will have teachers. Right, so, so our, our goal is to really uh, to have very strong relationships and very open communication uh, with the, the various employee associations in the district uh, so that we can quickly resolve differences that come up uh, between uh, collective bargaining rounds and that also when we get to those collective bargaining rounds uh, we can proceed with all due diligence. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not beneficial to uh, anyone for those to drag out. So the goal is to know uh, what the situation is, know what the issues are before we get to the table uh, so that we can work quickly to resolve those. And, and that, again, that, that's a relationship that's built over time. It's personal, uh, whether it's myself or other members of my administrative team, they're engaged in that dialogue. Uh, but uh, having those open lines of communication, being able to pick up the phone and have that conversation, uh, that's an important part of that success. Dr. Murley, we appreciate so much your coming today and uh, your next visit to I'm looking on behalf to of uh, John Karoff, Mike Peterson, and me, and Emily, and Josh. Uh, we thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to the, our next meeting to discuss more issues. And uh, to the audience, if you have any concerns, you can send it to uh, our senior producer here, Mr. John Karhoff, uh, Mike Peterson, or me. Uh, email us about any questions you're ready. Now you know that Dr. Merley is going to be with us soon. One uh, month. So we can trap you again. That sounds good. Uh, and we thank you very much for everything you do. We appreciate it. And good luck. Thank you so much for getting the good word out. Thank you.